let's get our Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. Now, in John chapter 1, what we're dealing with here in the Word of God is the Christmas story, uh, you see, according to John. Now, John uh, makes no mention of Mary. He makes no mention of um, Joseph. So, but we have the Christmas story uh, from John's perspective and John's standpoint. So, we want to turn in our Bibles to John chapter uh, 1 and want to read the first 14 verses. And this is John's commentary on why Jesus Christ came into the world. So, it's the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verses 1 through 14. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. I want to read these verses in unison together so that everybody joins in on the reading of God's Word. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, what we want to look at uh, this afternoon is this matter of uh, some Bible verses about why Jesus Christ came into the world, why the Father sent the Son, or what Christmas is really all about from the standpoint of the Word of God and uh, uh, the uh, Scripture. Now, um, first of all, in, uh, we just want to read some verses that tell us very clearly what Christmas is all about, you see, and why Jesus Christ came into the world, why he was born of the Virgin uh, Mary. Now, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, the Bible says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, See, a Savior who is or which is Christ the Lord. So now very clearly uh, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, see, a Savior, the Savior is born. Luke 2 and verse 11. And then uh, a very clear verse in the Word of God about why Jesus Christ came into the world is 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. See, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, something that everybody ought to know uh, and it ought to be spread far and wide. Now, James chapter, uh, or 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, see, that Christ Jesus came into the world. So you see, that is why he came into the world, 1 Timothy 1.15 you see, came into the world to save sinners. So you couldn't be any clearer than that. That's one of the clearest verses about Christmas in the Bible, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save uh, uh, sinners. Now, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, the Bible says, Here in is love. See, not that we love God, but you say, but God loved us, 1 John 4, 10, and sent his son to be the propitiation 
for our sins. Now, there's a great verse in the Bible that reminds us, say, that God loves the world. You see, uh, that he loves us. See, that uh, here in his love, not that we love God, but he loved us. And the Bible is very, very clear that he sent his son, say, into the world to be the propitiation for our sins. And that means that he died so that he made the sacrifice so that you and I could be forgiven of our sin and brought into a right relationship with uh, the Lord. Now, that's 1 John uh, 4 and uh, verse 10. And then in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14, very simple verse, it simply says, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. In other words, say, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. Just before that, the Bible uh, teaches that here is the way that God manifested His love towards us. Now, that word manifested there is a word that simply means to make clear, to make crystal clear. And what God has made crystal clear, according to the Word of God, is that the Father sent the Son into the world to be the Savior of the world. Now, there's no question about that as we study the Word of God. Now, turn in your Bible to uh, the uh, book of Romans, and in Romans chapter 5 and in verse 8. That's what we want to look at this afternoon, because here's a verse that summarizes what Christmas is really all about. Now, in Romans chapter 5, and we read here in verse 8, you see, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, say Christ died for us. Now, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, we have three things here. We have the love of God, we have the fact that Jesus died for us, and number three, that we are sinners. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, died. Now, um, as you look here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, see, God commendeth his love toward us. Now, that word commendeth, uh, most of the time people say, uh, you know, it means that God manifested, God demonstrated uh, his love uh, for us. And in other words, see, God's great revelation of his love was the fact that, see, he sent Jesus Christ into the world to die for sinners as we read and as we uh, study the word of God. But actually, the word commendeth there, when you study it out, it has a meaning of to prove. In other words, how has God proved that he loves you? How has God proved that he loves me? How has God proved that he loved the world? Now, see what the Bible says here. God commendeth his love toward uh, us. Now, in other words, say he actually proved that he loves us. Very similar to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See what you have there in the word of God. See, for God so loved the world. The world what? The world of lost sinners. That's what uh, John 3, 16 is talking about. See, for God so loved the world, see, of lost sinners. See, uh, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And that speaks of the judgment of God. And that speaks of being separated from God eternally uh, in hell. You have hell right there in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting uh, life. Now, say here in Romans 5 and verse 8, God commendeth his love toward us. In other words, see, God has proved to you and to me, God has uh, proved to all of us that he loves us. Now, the way that he has proved that, uh, 
And uh, how did he prove that love uh, to us? You see, uh, for you and me, and that was obviously, you see, by the death of his son. Now, see, as you study the Bible, see, how has God proved his love towards you and me? Through the death of his son. Now, Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, see, Christ died for us. See, and that is the way, according to the Bible, that God has proved his love for you and me by the Bible says here uh, that Christ died for our sins. See, and that is the great demonstration and proof that God loves you and me for God so loved uh, the world. See, and it has to do with the fact that Christ died, the Bible says, for us. In other words, he died on the cross so that you and I could be forgiven of our uh, uh, sins. Now, many times I think it's good to go back in the Bible and just be reminded of how Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. Now, I think a lot of times when we uh, talk about the cross, we read about the cross, and we even preach about uh, the cross, uh, it's like water off a duck's back. It's like, uh, well, he, he just uh, went to the cross and uh, he died. Well, as we study the Word of God, say that was a great demonstration that God loves you and me, the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Now, for instance, in Mark 10 and verse 34, Jesus foretold that they would spit upon him. That, that he'd be rejected. And very interesting as you read the Bible, and we could go to some of the verses in Isaiah, but we'll just keep there in the Gospels. See, Jesus predicted that they would actually spit in his face. You see, and he'd be uh, rejected. They'd spit in his face. Now, turn to Matthew chapter uh, 26. Now, in Matthew chapter uh, 26, and we read here in verse 67. Now, what we want to uh, think about is that Christ died for us. See, that he actually did die. Now, uh, here leading up to the crucifixion, after he was arrested, and this was one of the six trials that Jesus Christ underwent. There were three Jewish trials and then there were uh, three Roman trials. And at the end of each trial, he was condemned to death. That's the way, the, that's what the world did to the Lord Jesus. Now, in Matthew 26 and uh, verse 67, uh, then did they spit in his face. So they actually spit in the face of Jesus, as he predict, predicted they would. And then they buffeted him. See, they slapped him and uh, hit him. Uh, and then the Bible says, and others, see, these are these, uh, there are more, uh, several people there. And then they smote him with the palms of their hands. So now here is Jesus and the scene being um, led up uh, to Calvary. And the Bible says here, they actually spit in his face and they punched him and they slapped the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the next verse, verse 68 says, saying, prophesy unto, the, uh, uh, unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now, you see, uh, Matthew leaves it out. The other gospels mention that during this time, they blindfolded the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, imagine this. See, what they're doing, they're blindfolding him, they're spitting in his face, they're uh, slapping him, they're striking him, and they say, if you're the Christ, tell us who did it, in the sense that, see, he was blind, uh, uh, blindfolded. So, here is a terrible scene of shame and ignominy, 
as they are mocking and making fun of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we get a little discouraged. See, people make fun of us, but look what they did to the Lord Jesus. They spit in his face and they made a, a, a mockery of um, the things that they were saying and doing unto him. And then as, he's, uh, as we think of his death now, see, as he's uh, being led up to Calvary, then um, the Bible is real clear that in uh, Luke uh, 23 and verse 33, Jesus said that I will be scourged. Now, the word scourged simply is a word that means uh, to be whipped. And uh, many times before someone would be crucified, they would have a uh, professional executor take a literal whip and then they would beat the back of uh, the victim before he was crucified. Now, that is the scourging, see, the, the beating of the victim. Now, in John chapter 19 and verse 1, the Bible says that Jesus was publicly beaten. See, he was scourged. Now, now that was a terrible thing. Now, just like today, but see, again, we want to review about this fact that he actually died for us, that he actually suffered uh, 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 for us. Now, imagine someone today even taking a whip and then uh, beating the back of an individual. That's a, a, that's a terrible thing even today. Now, that is why uh, during uh, the, the Roman period, some people would actually die as a result of the beating with the whip, the, uh, the scourging. Now, why would they die? Because their, their vital organs would be exposed and, and sometimes uh, the flesh is ripped off uh, the back. So it's a terrible experience to go through. So number one, you might say by way of review, some of these things that they spit in his face, mocked him, made fun of him. Number two, they scourged the Lord Jesus uh, Christ and then, of course, the Bible is very, very clear as you read the gospel records that he actually was crucified. Now, uh, he predicted that in Matthew 26 and verse 2, that he would be crucified. See, so he told all these things to his disciples before it actually came to pass. See, he uh, foretold uh, uh, those things. So, and then in Luke 23, 33, the Bible says that he was actually crucified. Now, now again, we use the word the cross, crucified, the death of Christ, and sometimes we, we fail to take into consideration uh, what really happened when Jesus Christ was put on that cross. Now, in um, Luke 23 and verse 33, the Bible says, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, you see, uh, there they crucified him. So they brought him to the place called, uh, uh, called Calvary, and the Bible says there they actually crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, what does that mean? That means that there was a man who took a hammer, and he had the spike-type nails and he would smash with a hammer and nail Jesus Christ to the cross. That's the crucifixion. See, they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet to an actual cross before that cross was lifted up and uh, put in its socket. And uh, there's a special socket there uh, uh, for the, the cross. Now, see, that's a gruesome scene. See, that's, a, that's a, uh, something that's beyond our imagination. How many have ever seen anybody uh, put down uh, on a cross, lie on a cross, and have somebody smash nails through his hands and feet to make sure that, uh, that he was nailed to that cross? Imagine that. See, now that's, see, Christ died for us. Now, according to the Bible, that is a proof that God really 
loves us, that God is concerned about see, us. And uh, now, you see, now we want to look here at Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Now, this verse uh, clearly tells us that, you see, uh, how did God express his love or demonstrate or prove his love to you and me? And that was, the Bible says here in Romans chapter 5 and verse uh, uh, 8, you see, God manifested his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this tells us very, very clearly for whom he died. Now, look at Romans 5 and verse 8. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were, the Bible says, yet sinners. Now, that's what we want to look at, that word sinners. Say Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Here, this verse tells us that he died for uh, uh, sinners. Now, you see, we have a, a tendency in American Christianity to uh, sugarcoat the clear teachings of the Bible. And this is experienced in our modern day Christianity in America today, where we take the words out of the Bible and we make them mean something they really do not mean, or we uh, sugarcoat them. And this is clearly illustrated in American Christianity today. For instance, like uh, uh, we could illustrate it, so many words in the Bible, but like the word repent. See, now a lot of people would say today in our churches and in Bible-believing churches that the word repent does not really mean anything. That's really what they say. Say they teach that it does not really mean anything. And that's why there's not a lot of preaching about repentance or what the Bible teaches about it or a lot of study in relation to repentance. Now, the word we're looking at here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, say, is the word sinners. Now, if there's ever a word that is sugar-coated in our churches and in our preaching today, it is the word sinners. Now, as we uh, think of that. Now, when, when somebody says a lot of times in our soul winning and our witnessing, I think a lot of times we've compromised and, uh, even, and in our preaching and so forth because we say, well, uh, what does it mean to be a sinner? And uh, a lot of times uh, uh, the, our thought is, well, a person is a sinner or I'm a sinner because when I was 10 years old, my mother told me to dry the dishes and I did not dry the dishes. And because I didn't do that, I am a sinner. Now, children ought to obey their parents and so forth. But what I'm saying, many times that's the way we associate sin. Say, it's just a, it's a mistake. It's a, it's a minor offense. In other words, I, our thought is I am a sinner, but I'm not a big sinner. I just made some mistakes. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good woman. Now, see, what we're getting at, we do not want to sugarcoat the words of the Bible, see, which is very common today in American preaching and American uh, uh, Christianity. Now, you see, uh, when you study out this word uh, sinner, it's used many, many times in New Testament, and most everybody would say that the word sinner means uh, to come short of the mark. You see, uh, to fail to meet the standard or to come short of uh, the mark. You see, not to hit the mark and so forth. And uh, that is a very uh, lighthearted definition of the word sinner in the Bible. Now, when you study about the word sinner in the Bible, what it means is that I am a guilty sinner in the sight of God, deserving the judgment of God. That's the word sinner in the Bible. Now, uh, to see how uh, uh, to flesh that out and study it out in the Bible, we want to look at several verses in the Bible that have the word sinner. Say, what does that mean? Say, now turn uh, in your Bible to Luke chapter 7. And in Luke chapter 7 and in verse 37. Now, what we're simply pointing out now, the Bible definition of the word sinner. 
or how that word sinner is used in the Bible. Now, in uh, Luke chapter 7 and in verse uh, 37, Luke 7 and verse 37, Behold a woman in the city which was a, and the Bible says a sinner. Okay, now, what does the Bible, well, let's read on. When uh, she knew that Jesus sat at me, the Pharisees brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, the Bible says here in Luke chapter 7, and verse 37, Behold a woman in the city which was a sinner. Now, what does that mean? What do you think that means? Say, uh, does that mean that, okay, here was a woman in the city, and she was a sinner, but she was really a nice Woman. No, it doesn't mean that at all. See, and you know what it means. It means that everybody knew that she was a sinner and she had broken God's law. That's the, that's the word, way that word sinner is used there. In other words, it's not used in a good sense, amen? See, it's used in a bad sense. She was a bad woman. Now, look at verse 39. And when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, uh, this is Luke 7, 39, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman uh, this is that toucheth him. Say, for she is a sinner. Now, what does that mean? That, say, everybody knew in the community and in the town that she had broken God's law, amen? That she was, you might say, a bad sinner, and everybody knew that she broke the law of God. See, now what we're getting at, how is the word sinner used in the Bible? And I just bring that out without going into a lot of detail to show something about the meaning of the word. We all know she has broken God's law, we all know she's a bad person and not a, a good person. Turn in your, uh, your Bible to Luke chapter 19 and verse 7. Now, in Luke chapter 19, and we read here in verse 7, and this is the conversion of Zacchaeus, and the Bible says, when the people saw it, Luke 19, see, what we're getting at, what does the word sinner mean? Christ died for sinners. What does that mean? You see, now, in uh, Luke 19 and in verse uh, 7, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was going to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Now, who was it? That was Zacchaeus. See, Zacchaeus was a publican, and that simply means that he was a tax collector, and they were all crooks. And everybody knew that they were crooks. Now, and I say this advisedly, as you study about uh, the, uh, the uh, publicans in the Bible, that you see, Zacchaeus never met anybody that he did not rip off. He ripped off everybody he came in contact with. So now, see, the, uh, the Pharisees, see, they said, now, now, see, why would Jesus Christ go into the home and eat with Zacchaeus because he is the biggest sinner in town. Now, you see what we're getting at? See, the word sinner, it doesn't mean he's a nice guy. He uh, just sort of lost his way. Doesn't mean that at all. It means that everybody knew that Zacchaeus was a criminal, that he was a crook, that he was, and the Bible used the word, a uh, sinner here. Now, as you turn back a page, now, see, what we're looking at is the word sinner in the Bible. Say, not what you and I say is a sinner or how we use it today, but how it is used in the Word of God. Why? This is very important. Why? Because God demonstrated His love because Christ died for sinners. Say, uh, that's who he died for. Now, in um, Luke chapter uh, 18 and verse 13, the Bible says, And the publican standing afar off. See, now, again, see, the publicans were 
the crooks of the day. Don't want to go into a lot of detail. They got their job from the Roman government. They collected taxes and they were like a lot of governmental leaders. They, they were in charge. In other words, they could say, uh, you know, you owe this much in tax and they would lay the law down and they were uh, exorbitant in their demands. And as a result of it, see, uh, they were crooks in that way. See, they were ripping people off. They were not honest and uh, level-headed about, uh, about the thing. So everybody uh, knew, and as you read the Bible, see, for instance, the Bible talks about publicans and harlots, you see. And um, why? See, they were the known sinners of the day. No question about, uh, about that. Now, in uh, chapter 18 of Luke and verse uh, 13, the Bible says, and the publican, see, standing afar off. See, now, first of all, you have here the Pharisee who was a religious leader. See, uh, Jesus is giving a parable here. He went into temple and he bragged on how good he was. He said, I uh, uh, fast more than once a, a, a week. I give tithes of everything that I've ever had. All any money I've ever had, I, I tithe often. And so he's bragging about how good he was. Now, in the sight of man, he was a good man from man's standpoint. And he was actually a religious leader. Now, Jesus said the other man went up in the temple to pray in verse 13 of Luke 18. And the Bible says, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Here's a man who was contrite. Here's a man who was repentant. Here is a man who was sorry for his sin. Okay, read on in verse 13. And, um, and smote upon his breast, saying, and he would not lift up his eyes unto heaven. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, he wouldn't lift his eyes towards heaven. See, here is someone in Jesus giving the clear illustration here that this man knew he was a sinner. He knew he had sinned. He knew he was a, uh, a sinner. And uh, it's very uh, clear that he was a sinner in the sight of God. Now, it's very interesting when you study this out and you get into manuscripts. See, and all of the manuscripts say the same thing. See, and there's an article before the word sinner in all the manuscripts. I'm talking about every manuscript that you have in relation to this verse in the Bible. You see, you have the article before it. And see, one he's saying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. I am the sinner. I am the sinner of sinners. See, that's what he's saying. See, he was overwhelmed with his sin. Now, we're getting what does the word sin mean? You see, it certainly um, means that, you see, uh, I am a sinner in the sight of God in the sense that I have sinned. I am a uh, sinner in the sight of God. And I'm certainly in need of forgiveness. Now, see, that's the teaching of the Bible. When, uh, when you read these verses about sinner and sin in the Bible, every one of these people were in need of forgiveness because they were known as sinners. They were known as obvious sinners. See, clear sinners as we read uh, the Word of God. And by the way, this parable uh, reminds me of a friend of mine that mentioned that, uh, in fact, he mentioned it here when he preached in the church uh, some time ago, that he was preaching in a certain city, and uh, in that uh, city, uh, everybody knew everybody, and uh, they were having a revival meeting, and there was a woman who came who, to the meeting who was the richest woman in town. Now, and uh, everybody knew her, as the richest woman in town. For instance, she owned the biggest house in town. She did a lot of social work in town. Uh, she gave a lot of money in uh, philanthropy and things like that. 
and she was known as the wealthiest person in that town. So anyway, uh, my friend said she, uh, she came to the revival meeting that night, and he preached a simple message of the gospel that we are all sinners in need of salvation, that uh, without Jesus Christ, we will spend eternity separated from God in hell. And the only way you can be saved is through Jesus Christ uh, and how we are sinners in need of Bible uh, salvation. And so he went to the woman and spoke to the woman uh, after the, the service because he wanted to shake her hand and uh, tell her he appreciated her uh, coming to the service. And she said that, uh, he said that she looked him in the eye and she was mean and, and mad. And what she said was, she said, you have insulted me because you said I am a sinner. She said, I'm the best woman in town. I'm a member of the Methodist church. And how dare you tell me that I am a sinner? She had a cane and she smashed that cane on the ground. And she said, you should be ashamed of yourself to ever tell anybody that they are a sinner. Now, you see, that's exactly, when you read this story, this parable, that's exactly how the Pharisee was, amen? See, the Pharisee was saying, don't tell me I'm a sinner. I'm not a sinner, I'm a good person. I, I do good. I, I, I'm not a bad person. You see, and just like today, see, when people hear they are sinners, a lot of people don't like that. See, and uh, if they really get the meaning of uh, the word uh, a sinner. So um, that's why in 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, see, Christ Jesus came into the world, see, to save sinners. See, that is why he came. Now, a lot of people don't like that word sinner. My religion is good as yours. I'm a, a, a good person. But see, the Bible says he came to save sinners. That's the only person Jesus Christ can save is a, uh, a sinner. And let's for a moment, uh, it's a wonderful uh, study in the Bible. As you turn to Acts chapter uh, 26. Now, in Acts chapter 26, we read here about the testimony of, of the Apostle Paul. Now, in Acts chapter uh, 26, the Bible uh, uh, says here, Paul is giving his testimony, and it's uh, good to mark these verses in your Bible. See, in Acts chapter 26 and verse 10, and he says, which thing, Acts 26, 10, I also did in Jerusalem. And many, see, many of the saints did I shut up in prison. He uh, testified, so they go to prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. That's, a, that's really something. He said, when they were put to death, we think we have it hard today. He was going around persecuting the Christians, and the Bible says, unto death. See, and uh, I gave my voice against them. The Bible says, when they were actually put to death. Now, this man is not only a murderer, he murdered innocent people. He murdered Christians. And he says in verse 11, And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them, say, to blaspheme. We think we have it hard today. We don't know what it's all about. And being exceedingly mad. Say, no, he was not mad. He was exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now, in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul is giving his testimony. And he says, thank God Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Say, I am a sinner. And then he goes on in the next verse and he says, always remember this, if God can save me, God can save anybody. See, that's why he said, I am the 
chief of sinners. And we read about that in Acts chapter 26. See, and, uh, but he said, and then he goes on and he said, I'm an example. If God could save me, this big sinner, this wicked sinner that I was, uh, hurting and injuring innocent Christian people, if God could save me, God could save anybody. See, that's a great testimony unto uh, the Lord as we uh, see the Word of God uh, very clearly uh, what the Word of God is saying there. Now, see, when somebody truly gets saved, God changes their life. You see, now they're not perfect, but God changes them. And then we start growing and, and developing in the things of the Lord. Now, a lot of people don't realize, and it's good to study the Bible and be reminded of these things. The greatest passage in all of literature, inside the Bible and outside the Bible, you studied in high school, you studied in college, in literature, is what Paul said about love. The word charity there, obviously it's the word agape, love. In 1 Corinthians 13, see the same man that persecuted unto death God's children wrote those famous words. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am nothing. 1 Corinthians 13. Now there's a great conversion in the Bible. A man who was a great sinner, thank God he became a great saint, amen? Say God changed his life. And now he's writing about the love of God. And he mentions it in Galatians 2.20, who loved me, he said about Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me and gave himself uh, for me. Paul said in uh, Galatians 6, uh, 14, if I'm ever going to glory, if I'm ever going to boast, I will only boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, and um, so what a, what a testimony. Now, in Romans 3, 19, we're just talking about the word sinner. Thank God what God can do for a sinner. See, what he did in the life of the Apostle Paul. But now, in Romans 3.19, it says we're all guilty sinners. See, all of us are guilty sinners in the sight uh, of God. And then we use that verse many, many, many times, and we don't get the, the thrust of it and the power of it. And that's Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. See, this whole passage there, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But now, wait a minute. What is Paul actually saying there? Say what he's saying. Number one, if you're a Jew, you're a sinner in the guilty sinner in the sight of God. Number two, if you're a Gentile, you're a guilty sinner in the sight of God. If you're a heathen, you are a guilty sinner in the sight of God because you don't even live up to the light of creation that God has given to you. And so as we study you see, Romans 3.23 say, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody in the sight of God is a guilty, known sinner by God Almighty. That's why the Bible teaches we're sinners by birth. We all know that. No one, none of us would ever say, I was born perfect. I've always been, uh, I, I, I was perfect till I was five years old. No, say, uh, all children, the Bible is very, very clear, are born with a sin nature. See, we are born sinners. We all know, we have, uh, heard it a thousand times, you never have to train and teach a child to do wrong. You have to teach them to do right, but they're born selfish. See, and we're sinners by birth. See, and then the Bible teaches we're sinners by choice, and then we're sinners by our conduct, you see. Uh, and then we're sinners under the condemnation of God. Now, see what we read here in Romans 5.8. See, we have three great thoughts here in Romans 5.8. You see, 
Number one, God has proved his love. We learn here about the word of God. This is what Christmas is all about. Number two, you say, Jesus Christ died for sinners. That's how God's love is revealed. When you study about the love in the Bible, it's always, say, Calvary love. It's redemptive love. It's a saving love, a a love that will save the sinner. And then we see here that, you see, we are all sinners in the sight of God. And Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now, around Christmas time, how many times have you heard people say, Christ came into the world to bring peace? He did not come into the world to bring peace. That's why a lot of uh, Orthodox rabbis will say that they do not believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah because he didn't bring peace into the world. And that's an argument they have. But now you see, the Bible does not teach that Jesus Christ came into the world to bring peace into the world. He came into the world you see, to die for our uh, sins. Matthew 10 and verse 34, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace. That's what he said in uh, Matthew 10, 34, but a sword. Now, that doesn't mean, it's not talking about warfare, but he goes on and explains what it means. If you're a father and you get saved, your children may not be saved, and there'll be warfare in your home. A uh, wife might get saved, her husband's not saved, and there's warfare uh, in, in the home. And uh, see, that's what, he, what he's talking about in Matthew 10 and verse 34. He said, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. I came, in a sense, to bring division, and we all know that. If somebody is saved and they live for the Lord and take their stand for the Lord, they'll find they have enemies. You see, no question uh, about that. See, he did not come to bring peace into the world. He came to die for uh, sinners. And then uh, some might say, well, he came into the world to uh, feed the poor. No, the Bible doesn't say that he came into the world to feed uh, the poor. The Bible says he didn't come into the world to make the world a, a better place through politics. See, it's not... Uh, taught in the Word of God. Say, He came into the world to save sinners. Now, that's why as Christian people, we need to be very, very careful around the Christmas season. That we make sure we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. Macy's celebrate Christmas. J.C. Penney celebrates Christmas. The malls celebrate Christmas. All the radio stations celebrate uh, Christmas, you see, and, uh, and obviously they're not doing it in any way to honor Jesus Christ. That's obvious. Macy's, J.C. Penney, the malls are not in the business of honoring Jesus Christ. It's just a way to get people in and certainly to uh, make uh, money at this season of the year. So what I'm saying, we as God's children need to be very careful that we do not associate our celebration of Christmas with the way the world celebrates Christmas. You say, there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, presents and showing love and, and uh, appreciation, all that type of thing. But you see, we need to realize that according to the Bible, Christ was born to go to the cross to save us from sin. We're not saved by the crib. We're not saved by the manger. We're saved by the blood of the cross of Jesus Christ. So we need to be careful. We don't want to get worldly like the people of the, uh, the world. By the way, it's a good time to be a witness to the world, amen, uh, to our neighbors, unsaved people, to maybe express some love uh, towards them and appreciation and kindness with the hope that God will use that love and that kindness 
this time of the year. They might be a little more open to it than other times of the year, and we have more of an opportunity to do it. But you see, uh, uh, but by the grace of God, God might use that love and use that, um, that uh, encouragement to someone and that kindness to someone by the grace of God to help them maybe even in the future uh, to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm not talking about passing out a track. I'm talking about being kind, being nice, uh, showing our neighbors that we love them uh, and uh, so forth. And somehow by the grace of God, using that kindness in the future to be a better witness to them for the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, we see this in all the hymns, what Christmas is all about. Thank God for the hymn book. As we uh, were singing, only a sinner saved by grace. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. Praise God. We're only sinners saved by grace. Amen. Thank God for these great songs uh, in uh, the hymn book. That great song, John Newton. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. But what did Newton say? That saved a wretch like me. See, we're talking about sinners. Boy, he, he doesn't say that saved a sinner like me, a wretch like me. John Newton said, I know I was a sinner, a condemned, guilty sinner in the sight of God that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Thank God that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Thank God also for our hymn book as we sing that song. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner, but the only thing that can wash away my sin is what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross of Calvary. Then if you read uh, Romans chapter 8, then the next verse tells us that you see, he died so we might be justified in the sight of God. That means made perfect in the sight of God, be made right in the sight of God. And then the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, Romans 5, 9 says, he uh, delivered us from the wrath to come. We're saved from eternal hell by what uh, Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. We're justified. We're saved from the judgment of God. All that has to do with what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And if I come as a sinner, a guilty sinner, a condemned sinner, and I come to Jesus Christ as a repentant sinner, the Bible is very clear. All my sins will be washed away. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank Thee again for Your Word. And Lord, we pray that You might help us to realize that great truth. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We thank Thee, Father, that Jesus is the Savior, that He was born of the Virgin Mary there in Bethlehem. But, Father, we know as we study the Word of God, He was born to die. We thank Thee for Calvary. We thank Thee that Jesus went to the cross so that we could have salvation through his sacrifice and the shedding of his blood on Calvary. And as